Good morning and welcome. We are in Senior English B and our objective this morning as we are on page 1152 of our hymnal is to be working with the poetry of W.H. Auden and more particularly we're going to begin with the, uh, 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 the first of our two offerings, D.B. Arts. Uh, and, and the way we start is going to be a little bit different than normal. There are some poems that you can just pick up and read and totally get it. There are other poems that require background knowledge. In other words, without the background knowledge, the poem makes absolutely no sense. All right? Let's take a look at, um, at this poem, uh, you see, De Beaux Arts. And uh, we'll, we'll read it, and then we'll start the process of understanding it. Okay, let's take a look at it. About suffering, I'm, I'm with you on 1152. About suffering, they were never wrong, the old masters. How well they understood its human position, how it takes place while someone else is eating or opening a window or just walking duly along. How when the aged are reverentially passionately waiting for the miraculous birth, there always must be children who did not specifically want it to happen, skating on a pond at the edge of the wood. They never forgot that even the dreadful martyrdom must run its course, anyhow in a corner, some untidy spot where the dogs go on with their doggy life and the torturer's horse scratches its innocent behind on a tree. In Burgle's Icarus, for instance, how everything turns away quite leisurely from the disaster. The plowman may have heard the splash, the forsaken cry, but for him it was not an important failure. The sun shone as it had, as it had to on the white legs disappearing into the green water, and the expensive, delicate ship that must have seen something amazing, a boy falling out of the sky, had somewhere to get to and sailed calmly on. One of the reasons why I love to teach this, po this poem is that it seems so unbelievably impossible to understand. And then once you unlock one small key, the entire poem becomes so simple to understand. Everything about this poem has to do with the picture on the effacing page. Okay? So that's where we're going to start. The picture on the effacing page. Now, there's two things we want to say in our notes about that picture. One, we want to say who the author of that picture is. Two, we want to say who, what the name of that picture is, that painting is. This is a very famous painting, by the way. The painter is named who? Put it in your notes. Who is it? So you're looking at it. It's right there underneath the painting on page 1153. Okay. First of all, what's the title of the, of the painting? The Fall of Icarus. Now that's really important. You want to write that down. The Fall of Icarus. Okay? Who is the artist that painted this famous picture? His name is what? We use his last name. His name is Burgle. Okay? All right? So there's your, there's your painter, the fall of Icarus. Wait, wait, wait a minute. Icarus. Icarus of or related to Greek mythology. Icarus, whose daddy's name was, I use daddy intentionally, whose daddy's name was... Now, a few weeks ago... Yeah. Well done, Mr. Rothludner. A few weeks ago, I gave a little lecture about Daedalus Club, and I told you why we call it Daedalus Club. Remember? I said, Daedalus was this really crazy inventor guy who ends up stuck in this place castle with his son, Icarus. And Icarus says, don't worry, or Daedalus says, don't worry about it. I know how we get out of this place. I'm going to make wings. Icarus is like... Uh, what have you been smoking? No, seriously, <laughs> I'm going to make wings. We're going to put these wings on ourselves, and we're going to fly out of this 100-foot cliff uh, you know, tower. Icarus doesn't believe his dad at first, but Dadless is a pretty sharp cat, so he makes these wings. And he, sure enough, puts them on Icarus. Icarus starts flying around the, the cell. Dad says, Dad, Dadless, says to son Icarus, now look, when you jump out of this window here, you're going to fly. It's going to be awesome. But remember... 
The way I had to make these wings was by putting wax on the wings. Whatever you do, you can't fly too high to that sun because you get too close to that sun, that wax is going to melt off. You're going to fall into the sea. You're going to die. Icarus, like maybe one or two students I've taught before, has no time to listen to what an adult has to say. Right, right, right. Just give me the wings. I got the wings. That's right. That's right. No, no, no. You're not hearing me. You got to worry about flying too close to the I, I don't have time for it. Don't, don't worry about instruction. I just want to have fun. Give me the wings. Sure enough, he flies. Sure enough, he doesn't listen to the old man. Sure enough, he falls into the ocean. And sure enough, he dies. That is the story of Daedalus Icarus. Now, Virgil will write, or will paint a famous painting called Landscape of the Fall of Icarus. What do you find interesting about that picture when you look at it for the first time? Especially if, A, you don't know the title of this painting, and B, you don't know who Icarus is. What do you find interesting about this painting? By the way, can you find Icarus? Yeah. yeah. You have to search for him, don't you? Where is he? He's down in the lower right corner, and all you see of him is what? Just a couple of legs sticking out the water. Then you have this whole rest of the painting... Right? Where you've got, for example, a plowman. By the way, where's the plowman looking? Not He's not looking at Icarus who fell out of the sky and into the water. Notice the boat seems to be sailing, but it almost appears as if the boat's going to sail right past poor little Icarus, off to go do its project wherever that boat is headed. W.H. Auden. Now we're looking at a genius. W.H. Auden. He's sitting at the Museum of Beautiful Art where he sees this painting and it all of a sudden hits him you know this poem is a great predictor of the civilization that I now live in where terrible things seem to happen to people and nobody has any time to matter or care about it so he sits down and he writes a poem he calls the poem the Museum of Beautiful Arts, of course, in the French, Musée du Beau Art. And then he says something interesting in, now we're at 2B, two stanzas. Did you see this? Two stanzas. Do you see there is an identifiable break, correct? After the 13th line. Do you see it? There is an identif there's a physical break. Do you see it? And then we have the second part. This is poem is more like an essay than it is a poem. You have to know the information I just presented, and now this poem's going to start to make a whole lot of sense real quickly. About suffering, now we can work through the lines in exegete. About suffering, they were never wrong, the old masters. How well they understood its human position. What human position? The human position of what? This is going to be a poem about what? It's right there in the first line. About, about suffering. Define suffering in your notes real quickly. When you hear that word, what does that word mean for you? The word suffering. You got a, 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 a definition for me, Mr. Lang, that works? What is the suffering? If I were to ask you, how are you doing today? And you said, I am suffering. What would that mean? Good or bad? Okay. Normally bad, right? We're going to think of it in negative, pejorative terms. Suffering. Keep going, though. Suffering. I think it's when you lose everything. When, you're lo when you've lost everything. Not, not necessarily all physical. Or not necessarily physical. Could be emotional. Could be spiritual. Could be physical. About suffering, bad stuff, we might say. Uh, about, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Keeley? Like anguish. anguish, that's a great word. Anguish. Ugh. Right? About suffering, they were never wrong, the old masters. How well, what are old masters? Painters. Painters? Like Keep artists. going. Keep going. Painters? We're going to, because we're going to meet Virgo in the second stanza, aren't we? Right? Who else, though? Who else might be referenced as the old masters? I'm sorry? The old writers, the old philosophers, the old farts, the guys that l wrote before our time. They had something to say about suffering, and this is what they said. Take a look. How well they understood its human position. How it takes place. How what takes place? Suffering. suffering. How it takes place while someone else is eating, or opening a window, or just walking duly along. How when the aged are reverentially, passionately waiting for their miraculous birth, 
There always must be children who did not spe- who did not specially want it to happen, skating on a pond at the edge of the wood. Notice how this poem's first stanza, the lines run on to each other through the use of the semicolon of the colon. Did you notice this? It's as if he's kind of like just spilling out an idea. Those old timers, they had a certain view of suffering, and they weren't wrong about it. What was it that they were not wrong about in regards to suffering? Humans seem to think about suffering how? It happens. Poop happens. <laughs> right? Poop happens. That's right. That's our saying for it, isn't it, Mr. Lang? Of course, helping us out. Poop happens, right? <laughs> but wait a minute. That's just one side of it. Poop happens to us, to me. Poop happens to me. But what about everyone else's poop that's happening? Okay. Yeah. And that's your poop. That's your suffering. That's your it sucks to be you. Right? We are all more aware of what? Our own, Our own suffering than the suffering of those others. others. This morning, you do realize, you walked past students in the hall that are suffering. Right? You walked right past some of them. They maybe had a terrible, terrible night. Horrifically bad things happened in their life or are happening in their life. They barely had the energy to get up and come to school this morning. And they drug themselves here. One or two of us are saying, Dude, that isn't somebody I walk past in the hall. That's me. To which Auden says, Yeah, it seems to be something about human suffering. We have a tendency to be deeply aware of it for ourselves. But what about the suffering of others? Well, about suffering, notice, they were never wrong, the old masters. How well they understood its human position, how it takes place, while someone else is eating or opening a window or just walking duly along. How when the aged, old people, are reverentially, passionately waiting for the miraculous birth, old people get so excited about new births, there always must be children who did not specially want it to happen, skating on a pond at the edge of the wood. In other words, what is joyful for some people, old farts when a new baby is born, yay! Their little brother or their older brother or sister might think about the, the, the birth, what? Really? Like, really? Why do we got to have more kids? Like, really? I kind of liked all the attention myself. Really? Why do we? In other words, about suffering, there's always two sides. Right? About any experience, there's always two sides. And then Auden uses one of the most disturbing word pictures that you're ever going to read in a poem. But you gotta got to kind of read through it to understand what he's saying. Take a look at it. They never forgot that even the dreadful martyrdom must run its course anyhow in a corner, some untidy spot where the dogs go on with their doggy life and the torturer's horse scratches its innocent behind on a tree. These lines mean almost nothing if you don't understand the word martyrdom. What is a martyr? Someone who suffers. Someone who has been executed for a cause. We normally think about it as a religious cause, but it doesn't have to be a religious cause. What is a torturer and what is a torturer's horse? See, if you don't understand that reference, it, none of this little part of the poem makes much sense. One of the key ways that religious were tortured and killed was to put them, tie them to something and then tie them to a horse and then make the horse slowly walk away. And in the process, what would happen to the individual tied up? Yeah, literally pulled in two. It would begin by, of course, the spine snapping and then the body parts extracting. So whatever came off first and then second and then so on. And then, of course, the individual would bleed to death and die an excruciating, painful death. Auden says there's one player in that scenario who is innocent. Who is innocent in that scenario, that story? The horse. The horse horse doesn't know. The horse is just standing there eating on his little hay 
and all of a sudden he gets whacked on the butt, and so he starts walking forward. He probably surely heard the screaming behind him. He didn't know. And afterwards, after the martyrdom is over, he goes back to doing what? Eating more hay. It's not like he has any sense of guilt. Oh, I did something terrible. I just pulled that person completely apart because he said he believed in something other people don't believe in. That's so terrible. How will I live with myself? No, the horse has absolutely no interest in the suffering of the poor martyr. It, 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 doesn't, it doesn't even, are we ready to say it this way? It doesn't even register on his radar it occurred at all. Now let's go back and unpack this and put it back together, the first stanza. Some of you will point out, whoa, 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 this is a deeply dark poem. Oh no, it's way worse than that. This is a contemporary poem of a little ditty you may have heard of. We are the hollow men. We are the stuffed men, leaning together, headpiece filled with straw. What was the name of that poem? Mm -hmm. The Hollow Man. By? What was the poet? T.S. Eliot. Eliot, a contemporary of Auden. Auden will be playing a very similar game. Let's put it in our notes. This is the game of Matthew Arnold's Dover Beach. This is the game of the evaluation of a culture that has become modern. And in the process of becoming modern, where do people seem to care about the emotion and suffering of other people? Yeah, it, it basically sucks to be you. As if it's not enough, he now has a second stanza to prove his point, and guess where he goes? He goes to the very image that he had seen at the museum called the Fall of Icarus. Of course, in the story, the Fall of Icarus, Falling into that sea is the tragic part of the story. And yet, notice how Auden will say, in this, in this painting, no one seems to care about the fact that a boy fell out of the sky and is drowning in the, in the ocean. Take a look at how he says it. In Burgle's Icarus, for instance, see it? In Burgle's Icarus, for instance, how everything turns away quite leisurely from the disaster. The plowman may have heard the splash, the forsaken cry, but for him it was not an important failure. The sun shone as it had to on the white legs disappearing into the green water, and the expensive, delicate ship that must have seen something amazing, a boy falling out of the sky, had somewhere to get to, and sailed calmly on. Whoa, dark. Thomas Hardy, of course, wrote a poem about a woman who thinks that somebody has come to visit her at her grave and will ask a series of questions about who it is. Is it my family relatives? No, they're not dropping flowers anymore. They figure you're dead, you don't even gonna know. It must be my lover. No, no, went and found some other wife after you went. Must be my enemy. She totally forgot about you after you died. Oh, it's my doggy. At least my doggy loves me. And then the dog darkly speaks and says, Oh, dude, I totally forgot you were buried here. I was just burying a bone. <laughs> dark, dark. Uh, a continuation of that rather dark view of the human condition. What is that view? See, now that you've read this poem and exegeted, jot it down in your notes at 2A. What is the point Alden is making about the way humans cohabitate in the 20th century, the way we live together? What is it that he's saying about the way we live together at Warland High? What is he saying about your pain and my pain and our ability to connect with each other's pain? Wow, what does he say in this poem? And notice how he begins with this beautiful work of art to make this rather dark assessment of the human condition. How would you qualify it? What would you say, Ramos? What's he say about the way we live together? Uh, isolated. That's a beautiful way to say it. Let's, let's, use, let's use that word. Isolated. Outstanding, Mr. Ramos. A isolated. Meaning what? What does isolated mean? When you are isolated, you are what? Alone. You're alone. Let's use another academic word. Alienated. Alienated will be the term that many of these writers will use of this time period. They will say alienation. The great poets, Auden and Frost. You maybe will remember in your junior year... We, we studied Frost, the great American poet, and maybe you'll remember that poem about acquainted with the night, 
about a guy who goes out and walks all alone in the nighttime, but nobody calls for him. Or that poem, Out, Out, about the little boy who's working at the buzz saw, and his, and his sister comes out at the end of the day to say supper, and his arm gets cut off, and then he, remember, bleeds to death and dies. The last line of that poem was, and they, because it was not their loss, they went on with their work. That is to say, alienation. T.S. Eliot, of course, is the great poet of alienation in The Hollow Men. We are the hollow men, we are the stuffed men. Now, Auden is going to make the same argument. That is to say, in the 20th century, human beings lived closer physically, but emotionally, spiritually, farther and farther apart, more and more isolated. Last night, more people on this planet connected via Facebook than in the history of the world. Millions and millions of people were simultaneously talking, connecting, back and forth. So that means we're not isolated anymore, right? That means we're all one big happy family together, right? Or no? I don't understand. We are more connected now than we've ever been in the history of the world. That is absolutely true. And yet, you're arguing we're more isolated? How do you explain that fact? We are connected physically, technologically. How are we disconnected then? Notice, notice the opening lines of the poem again now. About suffering, they were never wrong, the old masters. How well they understood its human position. Well, are we saying something about human nature? That in the end, all we care about is our own pain? Our own pain? Stuff? Is that true? Is that who humans are? Or were we made that way through the technologies that made us less and less able to connect with each other? And what about all the texting? We text all the time. How can you make the argument that we're not connected? Do we say more and more and speak less and less. And is that a disturbing idea? We talk all the time and say nothing? Why do we say nothing? Auden continues to play the game with the unknown citizen. Your uh, painting on 1155 is an attempt to try to continue with this sense of isolation, alienation, the unknown citizen for Auden becomes his most famous poem. A, monu mar a, a, a marble monument erected by the state. Auden, for your notes now to deal with this poem, Auden was deeply concerned about the growing power of the state, of political institutions that increasingly removed individuality from people. So that by the time the modern state occurs with all of its technology, human beings all start to look the same way, sound the same way, do the same thing. If you'll think about it, it's kind of interesting. We all kind of wear the same clothes. We all kind of eat the same food. We all kind of watch the same movies and same TV shows. We engage in the same basic ideas. Is this a good thing or a bad thing? It increasingly makes us look all the same, which should suggest that we're kind of more together. And then Auden writes his famous poem, The Unknown Citizen. Let's take a look at it. By the way, you can go ahead and write this one at 2B right now. This is a poem of dark, dark satire. Dark satire. Remember, what do we mean by satire? Irony? Say one thing, what? Mean something else, entirely different. Let's take a look at how he does this. The unknown citizen. He was found by the Bureau of Statistics to be one against whom there was no official complaint. And all the reports on his conduct agree that in the modern sense of an old-fashioned word, he was a saint. For in everything he did, he served the greater community. Except for the war, till the day he retired, he worked in a factory and never got fired, but satisfied his employers, Fudge Motors, Inc. 
Yet he wasn't a scab or odd in his views, for his union reports that he paid his dues. Our report on his union shows it was sound. And our social psychology workers found that he was popular with his mates and liked to drink. The press are convinced that he bought a paper every day and that his reactions to advertisements were normal in every way. Policies taken out in his name prove that he was fully insured. And his health card shows he was once in hospital but left it cured. Both producers, research, and high-grade living declare he was fully sensible to the advantages of the installment plan and had everything necessary to the modern man. A phonograph, a radio, a car, and a frigidaire. Our researchers into public opinion are content that he held the proper opinions for the time of year. When there was peace, he was for peace. When there was war, he went. He was married and added five children to the population, which our eugenist says was the right number for a parent of his generation. And our teachers report that he never interfered with their education. Was he free? Was he happy? The question is absurd. Had anything been wrong, we should certainly have heard. Now, the last three or four lines of this poem are going to set up everything for us, aren't they, Mr. Brown? Notice the question, who was this guy, this uh, unknown citizen? What do you make of the JS backslash 07 backslash capital M backslash 378? What do you make of that? What is that? That's his number. That's his number. That is to say his, what do we call it in our culture? His name. We all have what? We all have a social security number. Now, for those of you who are bound for the university, you don't know your social security number yet. Trust me, soon you will. Why? Because at the university, guess what? You very rarely will be called by your name. They're going to reference you in computers by what? Your social security number. How come? Because that's easy, right? Computers can quickly find it, access it, and all of your intel is there for them to know. Was he happy? The question. Was he free? Question's absurd. If he had been anything other than happy, we certainly would have heard. What's dark about this poem? At what point is Auden making it to A? What is he saying about the modern society when he writes this poem? Let me ask it this way, because I think this is easier for you to write down in your notes. Auden seems to be suggesting something is being lost. What is it that he's suggesting is being lost? Individuality, keep going. Individuality. But I don't understand. Nobody came up to Mr. Keeley and said, Mr. Keeley, you can no longer be an individual. Nobody said that. As a matter of fact, notice this chap had everything that made him a modern person. Do you see it um, um, at line 20, 21? For Auden's day, what was that? Well, you had to have a phonograph, you know, it played music. You had to have a radio, you had to have a car, and you had to have a Frigidaire. Jot down in your notes. If we were talking about today, the things you have to have to be a person of today, to be a successful person, what would it be? Jot it down real quickly. What would you need to have to know that you are a successful person? <laughs> what objects would you need to possess to consider yourself a successful person? Got to have a nice, maybe what? Cell phone. Nice cell phone. Nice, house. nice house. Car. A nice mode of transportation. Nice a computer. <laughs> it would make sense if you had a computer that allowed you to be able to... A nice job. A good job. And you're good. Lots of money. All of these things are markers that tell you you have become a success. This chap had all of those things as well. Question... Was he happy? By the way, notice, it's a rhetorical question for Auden. He's like, Psh, that's a silly question. Of course he was happy. But what's the irony of what he's saying? He was too busy being blank to be happy. You fill in the blank. Because it's gonna, it, it might depend on the way you think about this. He was too busy being blank to be happy. Too busy being correct? What American poet said to be great is to be misunderstood? What, a, what American writer that we studied last year? Do you remember? Trust thyself. Do you remember? Comes from Ralph Waldo Emerson and the Transcendentalists. He who would be a man must be a nonconformist, he said. 
Auden and the like will look and see that the message of Emerson's self-reliance somehow got lost. <clears throat> Wait a minute, we already heard this. When a poet wrote a sonnet back in September that we studied, the world is too much with us late and soon. Getting and spending, we lay waste our powers. Little we see in nature that is ours. Notice there's not one mention of the word nature in Auden's poem. Did you see that? Did you see that? Not one word, one, not one mention about trees. Not one mention about my heart leaps up when I behold a rainbow in the sky. What does it mean when Wordsworth says, my heart leaps up when I behold? I am what? Was he happy? Was he free? The question is absurd. Wordsworth in 1800 was already on to this concern. Wordsworth said, the Industrial Revolution is inevitably going to change the way we think about being happy and being successful so that it becomes about how much stuff I can acquire versus how much I can enjoy a rainbow. And in 1800, people laughed at him. By the year you come to your senior year of, 12, of 2012, now all of a sudden we can have this discussion and we can ask, was Wordsworth kind of ahead of his time? Did he kind of see some things on the horizon that troubled him just a little bit? By the way, why would Auden have such a dark view? Why would Hardy have such a dark view? Why would Eliot have such a dark view in such a powerfully technologically advanced moment in time? Write it in your notes. What do you think it is that led to that dark view? All right, let's go to, um, very quickly, let's go to uh, Dylan Thomas's Do Not Go Gentle Into That Good Night. Thomas writes this poem to a father who is about to die. Do not go gentle, I'm on 1160. Do not go gentle into that good night. Old age should burn and rave at close of day. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. The wise men at their end, no dark is right, because their words had forked no lightning. They do not go gentle into that good night. Good men, the last wave by, crying how bright their frail deeds might have danced in a green bay. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. Wild men who caught and sang the sun in flight and learned too late they grieved it on its way. Do not go gentle into that good night. Grave men near death who see with blinding sight blind eyes could blaze like meteors and be gay. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. And you, my father, there on the sad height, curse, bless me now with your fierce tears, I pray. Do not go gentle into that good night. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. A few years ago, Mr. Durant, I was called. We need your help, Mr. McGee. Oh, no, what happened? There have been hoodlums that have gone around town spray-painting buildings. One of them is the, uh, the administration building, the wall. I said, well, I don't know. I don't understand how I can help. Well, because they spray-painted literary poetic lines. Maybe you can help us discover who it is. <laughs> so, sure enough, on the walls of the principal or the superintendent's building are the words rage, rage against the dying of the light. And as soon as I see it, I'm just trying to suppress my smile because a few days before we had had this conversation, Dylan Thomas says there are two ways to go. One way is to go quietly like sheep. The other way is what? Fight it. Fight it. Fight the forces that try to remove your individuality. Fight the forces that try to take away your voice. Rage against the dying of the night. Uh, and it was funny because then I, I uh, was going through Big Mac with my girl and all of a sudden out the left window as you're driving to get your food.